Well, um, this, uh, this story has, has many themes to it, and I suppose many stories do, but as you look down, it's obviously got history and personal histories, as you'll become apparent in a second. Geography, that's a fascinating part of the world. Geology, it's, it's very active. Remember the Aleutians of the Pacific Rim of Fire. Uh, genealogy, we found relatives of every single sailor on the boat and more. Technology, because finding it was <laughs> tricky. International collaboration, we collaborated with not only people from Japan, but people from Israel, from Brazil, from Australia. Uh, people move around. Um, flock of birds, wisdom of grouds, that's something I'm always fascinated by. Uh, we ended up with more than 20,000 people on our mailing list that we reached in various ways. Uh, and improbable, so an incredible number of coincidences that allowed this to happen, and of course, politics and psychology. Uh, coincidence number one, there were four World War II submarines lost in World War II that were found in 2006. Uh, that's the Grunion. Uh, that's off of New London. This is my dad. He was the uh, commander. Um, I knew him a little bit. I was born in 37. He was lost in, in uh, 42, but he actually uh, left New London in 42. Uh, this is our family. Uh, uh, Jim, as, as we uh, knew him, uh, sitting in the chair, and I'm on the, uh, in his arm there. Uh, my brother Bruce, my brother Brad in the center, and uh, my mother, who amazing woman. This is the, uh, the crew and their wives. Uh, the numbers are on there because we developed a, a, a crew, if you will, of genealogists who were related to some of the sailors on the Grunion. And they worked together. They never met each other one-to-one. Uh, -one. They met on the phone. Uh, this is the uh, telegram that my mother received, the classic, we deeply regret to inform you, uh, telegram. Uh, ironically, a second telegram came and said, uh, we cannot uh, know whether it was due to enemy action or not. Uh, we later found out that that was because the Navy did not want to give credit for sinkings that the Japanese would take credit for. By the way, just uh, incidentally here, the Japanese uh, thought and listed that they had sunk 400 uh, submarines. We only built 270. Uh, <laughs> and we actually lost 52 of them during World War II. Uh, when that, she got that telegram, she sent letters, handwritten letters to relatives of every, every single one and we have a, quite a collection of, of letters back that are all uh, quite emotional. Uh, could you help us? Was he captured? Is he in prison? Did he go down with the ship? Please, in the name of God, where is our boy? Only 22 years old. Some time ago, I heard from a friend of my son who was a radio operator in Dutch Harbor. He feels that there was a good chance that they were captured and that after the war, he could tell me more. Those were some of the volumes. This is even more than that. Uh, our dad did get the Navy Cross uh, for it. And then um, in the uh, 80s, my uh, middle brother Brad there got interested and uh, recognized that the connections were dying off here. So he started a search to connect with people who uh, knew about the Grunion, talking to people, for example, who were in a submarine uh, talking with uh, the USS Grunion. So we know the people who heard the last message uh, that was sent. And by the way, that last message was July 30th, 1942. The submarine was launched in March of 42. So it had a pretty, pretty short history, but an active one. Uh, well, uh, nothing much happened. And then we didn't know this guy, but in the mid 90s, Colonel Richard M. Lane from Colorado uh, was kind of a historian, and he bought this wiring diagram uh, in an antique shop, a wiring diagram to a Japanese freighter. 
And in order to find out about it, he posted it on a hobby site on the internet. And lo and behold, uh, there was a response uh, from a uh, Japanese person uh, in, in 2002. His name was Yutaka Iwasaki, and he was a translator for the Japanese Navy Department. And he had translated a story that was written in an obscure uh, journal um, of the uh, a Japanese maritime journal that described that Kano Maru, that was the ship, uh, interaction with a submarine. And I uh, searched on the internet uh, through various hobbyist websites. And one of these ones that had lots of posts on it, I think it was about the 50th post, I saw the same name. But I know there are a lot of names very similar in Japan. So I couldn't necessarily be the same one. So I wrote him a letter and said, uh, I am the son of the commander of the Grunion, et cetera, et cetera. And are you the person who translated this story of this interaction, and could it be? And he sent this letter back saying, it's me. Sincerely, I pray for the repose of your father's soul. And that has led to immense amount of communication. This is the actual article that he translated. Uh, so it's really more like a, uh, a, a newspaper. And, uh, but it, if you look up at the top, it says, we sank US submarine. That was the article. And that article was actually written in 1963. It's just that we didn't know it. The United States Navy didn't know it. And the Japanese Navy didn't know it. Now, why is that? Well, um, the US Navy didn't know it because they wouldn't normally have access to this sort of stuff. The Japanese Navy didn't know it because this was a report from their merchant marine. And merchant marine are obviously at a lower level than the official Navy, so they didn't believe anything they wrote. So uh, as Yutaka told me, I think this is the same all around the world. And I said, you are right. <laughs> that is a picture of the Kano Maru and is actually beached on a harbor in Kiska Island. And where is Kiska? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a long way away. Uh, that's Anchorage over there. That's 1,600 miles. So it's about from uh, New York to Denver. Um, so this is a long way away from the Alaska we know of it. Uh, but Kiska and Attu were occupied by the Japanese in World War II. Uh, they, they invaded uh, in uh, uh, early uh, 42 and weren't uh, removed uh, until uh, later on in uh, uh, 43. Uh, Atu, there was a big battle in Kiska. Uh, they slid out in, in the middle of the night and, and escaped. The Aleutian Islands is a war, or the Aleutian War was not very well covered in the media or in books, in fact. There are a few. But it was a very uncomfortable war for all parties. Uh, it was, frankly, an embarrassment. Many, many troops on both sides were lost to weather. Uh, Dutch Harbor, which is about here, which was our closest uh, base uh, early in the war, uh, the Japanese bombed it. Um, sometimes the winds were 100 miles an hour. So when they took off the planes, the B-17s, they took off backwards. Think about that. <laughs> they revved it up as soon as they got off the runway. They started falling back. And you have to wonder, you know, what's the wind going to be like when we're coming back? So anyway, uh, I suppose you could sort of go all the way around if you ca caught the dust room. But uh, it was, it was uh, an interesting thing. Now, it turns out uh, there was some information in that article about this interaction so much that it actually showed the freighter here and the submarine here. Uh, and what happened is two shots were initially fired. This was 5.30 in the morning. The water was glassy. It was kind of foggy. First torpedo missed. The second torpedo hit and exploded, uh, took out the engine, uh, the radio room, and the stern deck gun. This was an armed freighter. 
And uh, we, we later were able to read uh, the diary of the uh, captain of the Kanomaru. And uh, this was not a popular run, I'll tell you, in Japan. Uh, uh, the, the date, John? Uh, uh, summer of 42, 1942. So it would have been daylight at this time. Uh, yeah, it, it was light, but recognize if when you fly over the Aleutian Islands on the way to Japan, you never see the islands. They're always under, under clouds. And uh, anyway, so uh, it, sat, it was sitting duck in the water. The submarine then went around here, and the boat, uh, which had been cruising at about 15 knots, continued to coast, and uh, it fired uh, three more shots. Uh, one missed, and two hit, direct hits, but bounced off the side. So they were duds. Now you have to understand, this is not, oh darn, we didn't get them. The submarine leaves a trail. It's like an arrow. I am here. Shoot me. So uh, that's exactly what the Kanemaru did. They did have a four forward deck gun. And uh, the submarine had been cruising at periscope depth, made a turn here, coming back. And one of the shots hit what they call the bow wave. Now, to give you, you know, more coincidences, not only do we get this article, but we later find with the Japanese friends we had made, including a writer for the Asahi Shinbun, uh, we find the records, including the logbook of the Kanemaru, misfiled in the Japanese defense archives. And hey, that's life. And, and that's part of what research is all about. But uh, it, it was an interesting challenge. In 2005, I was at one of our medical meetings, and our guest speaker was this guy, uh, Bob Ballard. Bob spins a great tale. Remember, he's the guy who found the Titanic and uh, is just a phenomenal speaker and a very, very uh, knowledgeable guy. And I talked to him after this meeting uh, about our situation and what he thought about it and the fact that we had rough indications about the story and so forth. And his indication was, um, uh, I would go after it if I knew I could find it. I'm not ready for that, based on the information you have given me. Um, but he did give us a lot of hints. And this was uh, actually, he was at Boston Scientific here. Uh, giving us uh, some suggestions on strategies we might follow. And uh, in 2006, uh, we chose to follow those strategies. He was off in the Black Sea discovering ships that were just a little bit older than this submarine. And um, what we did is we contracted with a outfit that uh, does work for oil rigs and so forth, and they have... Uh, uh, ultra or not sonar rather uh, for side scan sonar uh, that they can uh, search the bottom with. This is a, a crab boat, very much like those ships you see on the. There's a television movie about the the, the rough weather uh, out there. This is in Dutch Harbor actually, and the crab boat has been modified with these uh, little uh, containers. Uh, one is actually a sleep container. The other one contains a sonar shack where all the equipment uh, is left. And this blue thing uh, allows uh, the sonar equipment to be trailed behind the ship. Uh, this is another one uh, taken a year later. And you can see we have a bit more on board. But uh, notice the two uh, cranes which turned out to be very, very useful. One of the things that ship did not have is something uh, they call dynamic positioning, meaning uh, uh, angles or planes on the side of the ship that can keep it level and propellers that can keep it in the uh, same location. We had, as we said, the equivalent of that because we had a captain who knew the area and really knew how to uh, treat those boats. This is the sonar. Uh, they, they call it a tug sometimes. Uh, there's the crane, and it, we lower it over the stern in this case. And this is the uh, pulley. And there's a, a line that goes to a winch with several miles 
of cable on it. And this is sort of the diagram. Uh, here's the boat. Here's the cable going down. And the first thing that it hits is a heavy weight. And then there's a light tether that goes to the towfish or the tug. And that's the sonar. And the reason for doing that is if the ship is healing and bouncing up and down, that acts as uh, sort of a, a clutch, if you will, to uh, prevent it from uh, moving uh, the towfish. This is the inside of that shack with lots of screens. Uh, this is the team. Uh, and in this case, we are in Adak Island, another Aleutian Island uh, that was about halfway out. Uh, and uh, that's myself, and that's my brother Brad, who was able to come out then, but uh, he just died last, last year, but he was able to see the results. This is the first uh, shot we got of the so-called target. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not sure if I would say that that is a target, but uh, that's what expertise does for you. This is another pass. Now, that towfish, that sonar, is not near the surface. That's dropped down so it's maybe a couple of hundred feet above the bottom. But the problem is the bottom isn't flat. By the way, all those islands are volcanoes. Everything is the side of a volcano. So that's one of the challenges. But this is a pass that is a bit closer. And this is uh, taken with a higher frequency. And then we have this picture. Now, this is the one we went back. And I showed this to Bob Ballard and said, what do you think? And his response, in effect, was, look, don't let your desire for it to be the sub you know, mislead you. This looks like a surface ship to me. It was a little bit shorter than the length that we were given. You measure the length with sonar as well. So uh, that was something we had. And then we took, uh, by the way, this, that search covered about 200 square miles. Now, that sounds like a lot to you, but that was down from 10,000 square miles, which is where we were starting. So everything is relative. Uh, we reassembled. This is a, a, a post-processing for, for those of you in the medical world uh, would, would know this in the ultrasound. Uh, and this was, of course, my, my frame of reference. Uh, this is where the target was. This is about a mile between these red circles. But there's something up here that looked to us. And then if you look very carefully, it looks like there's a slide trail between the two, which means that it could have sunk and slid basically three quarters of a mile until it stopped. And then in 2007, with that uh, sonar data, we went back to take another look. Now, one of the concerns on each of, each of these this is the, uh, our next uh, crew. I was the only family member able to go. My, my oldest brother uh, would love to have come, but he really gets seasick. And I'll tell you, this is not a place to be. And, and this is not the boat. Uh, you, you bounce around a lot. Uh, that is our boat in Kiska Harbor. Uh, that is from Kiska itself looking down at the dock that was built in 1942 by the Japanese, and that's the uh, ship over there in the, in the corner. So you can get a sense of scale, and that's, that's, the weather is always like that. Uh, but Kiska is not empty. Kiska is pretty much like what it was 65 years ago. That was one of the mini subs we found, and there were all sorts of gun emplacements lying there. As I say, it's not a, it hasn't been settled. Uh, there was a small encampment there before the war. Uh, now it's totally empty. Uh, but uh, there were actually some Aleuts who lived there in the 1700s until the Russians visited. And uh, uh, they caught the local diseases, and that was the end of settlements there. One of the things that helped me uh, a lot, and, and us a lot, was uh, reading this book about the end of uh, World War II by Max Hastings, to be have a better understanding of the theory behind uh, the Japanese uh, behavior. Um, this was one of the days we were there when this is the, our wind meter reaching 60 knots. At one point, it got up to 75 knots, which is about 90 miles an hour. And that's when you'd rather be in the harbor, which, which we were. 
Uh, and it, it's not only that, uh, you can't, you got a crane and you're lifting this thing that weighs uh, about 1,500, 2,000 pounds and you can't launch it when it's really wavy. It's a million dollars. You don't want to slap it into the side of the boat. And uh, this now is, this is being launched off the side of the boat. Uh, this is the line that goes to that. And if you look at this, this is sort of the outline. This is before it's being lifted up. This is the winch. It's a huge winch with a couple miles of line on it. That line goes across up into this wheel, down into this. This is a weight, and also it's got some electronics with it. That's actually a, a railroad wheel. That's why it's the weight. And then see this yellow line here? That's the, the tether or the soft line that goes to the actual ROV, remotely operated vehicle. And this isn't just a camera, it's five cameras. These, uh, these four, and then there's another one on an arm down here. And then this is a sonar device, short range, that allows us to look closely. And here's the range of high power uh, lights uh, that are on it. And then we also had a little ROV shack. And then um, uh, there are so many different little stories here. We got a lot of people who were uh, World War II submarine veterans. Any of you serve on submarines? OK, well, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll show a little bit more. But we got some submarine vets who really were able to help us uh, understand exactly what we were looking at when we saw these things. And we, uh, when we lowered our, our ROV, another coincidence, uh, basically, in 20 minutes, we found the submarine. Now, I had David Gallo, and you may or may not know him, but he's one of the top scientists at Woods Hole on board. And he said, you know, I almost didn't come on this trip because all my buddies at Woods Hole said the chance of our finding anything was zero. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you like underdogs, and hey, we all love underdogs, <laughs> Uh, that, was, that was a pleasurable moment. And then, ironically, uh, we were just you know, absolutely blown away looking at this thing, incredible pictures. Uh, in 20 minutes, we got hauled off. Remember, the ship is way, way up there with, you know, uh, it was a little over 3,200, so just shy of three quarters of a mile. And, and uh, even between the front. The submarine, by the way, is over 300 feet long. It's a long, skinny thing. Um, but one of our uh, helpers, if you will, looked at the three hours of video we had and reconstructed this, including the missing parts. Um, so that was awfully helpful. And here's uh, another drawing and then the actually outline of the submarine and where the engines are here and the torpedoes fore and, and aft. Um, this is an actual shot of the COD. The USS COD is actually a sister ship to the Grunion and it's located in Cleveland. It's their museum. And it's the only World War II fleet boat or Gato class boat that hasn't been uh, modified to uh, uh, allow people on it. So you can see these, the, the torpedoes are pretty good size, and they represent potential hazards uh, as well, because you have a door at the back, that's the back door, and then there's a door at, at the front. And if you go through depth charging, which the Grunion had, uh, then there's a risk of, of leakage. This is one of the uh, earlier pictures. This is that hatch, that open hatch that was referred to in the Today Show and I was just plain wrong. Uh, this did not open up on the surface. It opened up about 600 feet below the surface because that's when the submarine imploded. And you'll see in the following images. Uh, this is a close-up of that same wheel. This is the so-called dog. That is a little a latch, and it's broken off. And so this thing was hit with an enormous pressure wave that knocked it out. This is one of the pictures we took from the stern. This is a picture that was taken in 1941 uh, on the dock. The real clue that it was the Grunion, outside of the fact there was only one US submarine lost in the Aleutians, uh, was this thing called the prop guard. 
and there it is right here. And But other than that, you can see uh, there's the rudder. This is the stern dive plane, and that's one of the uh, propeller uh, uh, blades right there. There's a close-up of the propeller blade, and you can see we could get uh, very, very close. It was kind of interesting on the Amherst cover, magazine cover, the choice of that photograph was rather interesting because it's, it really shows the immense amount of color that exists at that depth. Um, this was kind of interesting in that this looks like almost a brand new part with little friends, of course, on board. And, and uh, as we sent photographs around, they were sent back with interpretations of people writing on them. They would explain to us what every single thing that was in the drawing uh, function was. For example, this is the hatch uh, on the conning tower. And it had a real distortion on it that was from the inside out rather than the outside in, which is one of the hints of what would happen uh, if you had partly imploded it. Um, and then another story is these ladies who were all uh, relatives of the sailors, uh, but they were all uh, gene genealogist hobbyists. And uh, they, it took them a, about a year and a half, but they found relatives of every single sailor on the submarine. And this is an example. Peter Stevens, wait a second, what's wrong with this? Son of Milliner Thomas. OK, his name had been changed, right? So found the wife's second marriage in Pennsylvania marriage records, discovered new last name was now Stevens, found she was listed in Social Security Death Index in Florida. Uh, no obit newspapers who so looked in probate records and found information about her that way. Probate records listed two sons, one of Peter K. Stevens, wrote to every Peter Stevens in Florida and Pennsylvania. Our Peter Stevens had an unlisted phone, but public records said he lived in Allentown, Pennsylvania, wrote to every Stevens in Allentown, and finally uh, got it because it went to his daughter's house. We met Peter Stevens later, but that was obviously quite, quite something. And even more uh, astonishing was finding the son of one of the sailors uh, who the sailor had married, married a Filipino woman, and uh, they had had a child in the Philippines who had been hidden uh, during the war years to you know, escape from the Japanese because he looked American. And, uh, but later on, we found out he came back and uh, were able to, to trace him and his son. And when uh, he call, was called by this Mary Bentz, uh, at first, he wanted to hang up because this was a voice from the past and it didn't make any sense. And later on, you know, it was revolutionary to him. He said, you've told me about my life that I didn't know anything about. And how did this happen? Well, part of it was getting articles in papers. Not just a few, but a lot. <laughs> and um, finally, we, we got an article in USA Today. And uh, if I had this on the web version, and when you uh, click over this uh, on the web, it would pull up the story of each of the sailors. And we were missing six pictures, but we got relatives of, of all of them. And, um, and then finally, in October, uh, this past October, we went to Cleveland uh, for the USS Cod. That's it. You can see the, the sign on the side there. Uh, that is a twin of the, of the Grunion. The United States Navy, uh, the week before, recognized the fact that we had found the Grunion. And those of you who know, know our worldly would know that was as big a project as finding the blasted <laughs> submarine. Uh, uh, but it was wonderful. They were classy. Uh, they sent an admiral. Uh, there he is, young guy. And we had uh, uh, over 100 relatives there, uh, over 200 people total. And uh, now I think the, 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 revenue, the relative list is almost 250, 300. Um, 
and it, and it keeps growing because of, of those articles. Uh, so it's been sort of interesting. And then during that uh, uh, show, this is Yutaka Iwisaki, and he is in Kobe, Japan. And this is Skype, free. And that's an 8x10 screen. <laughs> and uh, so we are video conferencing with him. And if you look in the corner here, you can actually see this is the assembled group listening to Yutaka and, and his daughter uh, uh, talk. And then uh, we actually rang a bell uh, for uh, every, every sailor and also all the ships that had been sung. Uh, if you've got sharp eyes, you may say that's kind of interesting because that bell has the name USS Grunion on it. Well, it turns out that that, that bell was found in Greenville, Mississippi. there was a Presbyterian minister, uh, a chaplain serving in World War II in the Korean War, and it was during the Korean War that in a junk heap in Pearl Harbor, he found that bell, and he went and asked if he could have it. And they said, no. <laughs> Just say, you, you, gotta, you gotta love these things. And, and uh, you can't write movies like this. Uh, and so he went off on a ship into the South Pacific as part of his chaplainship duties. And then suddenly, um, another ship pulled alongside and it contained this bell. Now that, that bell is 150 pounds. It's not as if you, know, you put it in a small envelope. But anyway, he took it back to Mississippi and there it stood in the conference center for, for many, many years. And uh, there was a sign underneath it, you know, talking about the sailors, uh, or the soldiers and sailors um, who had come from Greenville, who'd lost their lives in the war. But no recognition that actually one of those sailors came from the Grunion, came from Greenville, Mississippi. And uh, we were the ones who connected it uh, for them. And then this lady here, this is a nice uh, article about her turns out to be the wife, 97 years old, of the captain of one of the sub chasers my dad sank. Uh, this is her in 1932, uh, 20 years old, and, and her young husband, military. Uh, and this is her and her three sons surviving widow, three sons. I don't know if you get the parallel, but I'm the youngest of three sons. So, and they're about the same age. So it's, it's a rather fascinating coincidence. And um, she very nicely sent us. Uh, uh, the, uh, the third one, the one in the middle, was Yutaka Iwasaki. He arranged it. And, but she sent us uh, these. Uh, this is a case for uh, an amulet and, and some other religious things. Uh, so that was meant to be uh, an effort to recognize that wars aren't the best thing, but when you think about it, the soldiers who fought on both sides uh, were dedicated, uh, they were innovative, they worked like the devil, uh, they believed in a cause. It's just the leaders had different aims. And uh, there's a picture of that bell in Mississippi. Uh, and and uh, we borrowed it for the, the ceremony and have uh, now, now returned it. And this uh, was my th uh, three brothers, or myself and two brothers, and Brad in the center. We gave a talk uh, down uh, at New, New London uh, for a group. And that is the Kiska Volcano and you know, when I first went out there, I was concerned that the weather was going to be so bad that I wouldn't get any days that we could go out. So at the end, uh, I, I certainly felt and said it, this, was, this ship wanted to be found. Um, we, I not only did a little service for the sailors, but one of our crew who worked for the sonar 
uh, company, or the ROV company, rather, um, was Japanese. And he did a service for the Japanese soldiers as well. And we also located some of the Japanese wrecks down there. So it, it's been uh, an enormous sort of special privileges. And I say it's lots of different themes here. Tons of people were involved. Uh, did amazing amounts of work. We have had an article published for every single sailor that was on that submarine in their local paper. So it was an enormous sort of dedication. And again, I, I sort of like to think about the fact that this wasn't just you know searching for my dad. Uh, sure, it was. But it was for the 70 sailors. This, First of all, this is what our dad would have wanted. But also, 50 million people lost their lives in World War II. I mean, a lot of them non-combat non types. But uh, it's, it's really a recognition that we're able to be here because uh, those people uh, believed in saving the way of life that we have developed. Thank you. Ah, oh, OK. Well, we'll do some questions. The first question was, how did the bell not end up at the bottom? Well, because they didn't take the bell when they went on war duty. They removed it and set it aside to put it back when it came back. Gary. John, uh, have you added up the cost of this tremendous <laughs> Only from you, Gary. <laughs> How about I put it this way? If it had been your tax dollars, it would have been 10 times as much. <laughs> we, we did not bring anything up from the ship. Uh, in, in Navy lore, uh, the ship is the grave. It's the resting site. And so we respected that. Yes? Yes, you said you had DNA each of the sailors that was on that sub, or did I? No, no, no. Uh, actually, that's an interesting story. The question is, is how do we find out who was actually on the sub when the sub went there? Because along the way, we got a note from somebody uh, who said, my dad was on the Grunion, and he died two years ago. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> what happened here? It turns out that when the submarine went from New London through the Panama Canal and then up to Pearl Harbor, and then on its way out to the sea between the Aleutian Islands and Japan, it went to Midway. We didn't know that, but we found out it did. One of the sailors had a gallbladder attack. He, uh, he came to our memorial. In, uh, not that sailor. His son came to the memorial and gave a, just a wonderful, wonderful talk. Yes, sir. John, on this long journey, at what point did your emotions peak? Uh, you can probably figure this out. I, when you get in a project like that, you get into discipline mode, and, and you don't want to let things go out. Uh, along that, that, that side of things. I, I think, first of all, I was raised in a family where emotion was not a good thing. Uh, you were supposed to be, you know, tough it out. And um, uh, I guess, certainly seeing the submarine, I wasn't really sure we were going to do that. That was one moment. But I think afterwards, <coughs> much more powerful was recognizing what these sub ladies were doing and then meeting what turns out to be a family that we didn't know we had. Because we all shared this incredible history together. And, and you can imagine some of the stories when these people were first contacted. Uh, they, you know, some people wanted to hang up. Uh, other people, they just couldn't believe it, and they'd bring people in, so forth. So when we finally gathered in Cleveland, it was 
an amazing time. Uh, and, and that was heartwarming. But then again, uh, our connection with Chio Shinoda, she's the, the, the woman in that picture, she showed, sent us pictures of her garden and you know, we sent back and forth. I was just, that's a, that's a very, it sort of gives you hope sometimes when you see all the other things going on. Yeah? What is your, the final conclusion about why it went down? Was it a depth charge or was it a hit, hit by a shell? If it was surfacing, why was it surfacing if there was another Japanese uh, anti, anti sub Correct. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, the surfacing, we're pretty convinced now, was something called a brooch. Meaning, when you, the, the submarines are long and squinty, skinny, and if you turn them quickly, they tip and they rise. It's hard to maintain the depth level in a submarine, period, much less when you're moving around a, around a corner. And we think it broached and it came up. We initially thought it was going to surface and shoot it with its deck gun. The deck gun wasn't very big, and the deck guns on the freighter were actually slightly bigger. So that wouldn't have made a lot of, lot of sense. So um, we think, and we have a, a lot of knowledge of what was going on when that shell hit. After that, there was a dull thud, suggesting an underwater explosion. Uh, there was oil, there was flotsam, and so forth. Uh, that shell would have been about three inches in diameter, eight, eight, nine centimeters, I think, is the actual dimension. And um, it could not possibly have penetrated the hull of a submarine. But it could have hit uh, something that could have precipitated a crisis. In fact, we think the crisis had already started, and it added to the crisis. And it turns out, uh, when you saw that picture of the stern of the submarine, the stern dive plane was down, and it's that deep position. That is a geared mechanism. It couldn't move easily. So it was put in a down position and never removed it. What caused all the damage, and I've got hours of, of video, obviously, uh, was an implosion. In other words, that the, the pressure vessel of a submarine below 600 feet would collapse. And it collapsed in the bow, and it collapsed in the stern. That forced uh, an enormous amount of pressure towards the center where that hatch was. And it hit with probably 10,000 pounds of pressure, just like that. And that's what blew the hatch open. Oh, and, at the same time that it broached. Uh, the, the brooch was not the, we don't think the brooch was a contributor to the loss. We think it was a control loss. And somehow that shot may have created a crisis in the uh, control room where they control the, the dive planes and so forth. And therefore, if, for example, that shot had ignited a shell in the conning tower that might have been brought up because they were going to go to the deck gun, so that it created a, a counter explosion because there was uh, some sort of a thud, uh, that could have done it. You don't have to hit everything. You have to, if you take out the control, you'll do it. But it went into a steep dive and wasn't able to pull out. Now, another little uh, factoid is that the submarine may have been going 90 miles an hour when it hit the bottom. And initially, you how can you get anything going that fast underwater? Well, uh, there is, you know, it's a lot of, lot of gravitational pull on it. On the, on the difference between the, the steel and the, and the water. But uh, it's, it's quite uh, aerodynamic. And so when it goes down like that, uh, it would uh, literally drop down to the 3,000 foot level 
uh, in less than about five, four minutes. Yeah. I assume the Navy was interested in all this. How much help were they? Well, uh, I'm fascinated by how you get things done in bureaucratic systems. I definitely think, uh, you know, I'm a believer in it's easier to ask for forgiveness than ask permission. And, and uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is, is we talked with a lot of Navy people, but large organizations don't have leaders. They have people they call leaders, but the leaders don't know what's going on in their organization because it's large. I don't care what it is, whether it's a business or a government or whatever it is. And uh, our theory was this. Uh, we actually had people on our team who were saying, the Navy won't allow you to do this. You've got to be kidding. Uh, and, but but that, that's this, this frightening sort of belief that you know, the rules prevent you from doing things like this. So we did it, and then we let them know. <laughs> and uh, initially, uh, there, there were people who were saying, uh, you know, civilians can't, this is a Navy sort of thing. You're not supposed to touch things like that. Well, we, we didn't. We just took pictures of it. So we actually did did everything uh, and but it took a while we had to go through the formality of preparing the equivalent of a thesis to send them why this was the Grunion and why it needed to be recognized and that was done by as it turns out uh, the person who is uh, head of that cod museum and and he's an amazing writer and that's always a good thing to have <laughs> yeah Jim <laughs> I did talk to some of them, yeah. I, did, I haven't talked to Ballard, uh, uh, but I mean, he's followed it, I know. You, you, you know <laughs> we've had enough visibility there. Uh, but again, uh, when you're doing search projects like that, uh, it's risky. And let's face it, we, we, had, we had a lot of help on our side. <laughs> Ship. Yeah. Did that come from the records of the Japanese ship, or where, where did that come from? Where that came from the logbook of the captain of the King of Maru. Okay. Yep. And three eyewitnesses that we found in that incredible file in the Japanese National Archives. New Port strikes again. Yeah. Where? John, you mentioned in passing that your mother was a very remarkable woman. Could you tell us a bit about her? Um, she uh, raised three boys in, in, in an interesting way. Because uh, we were, partly because of our dad, he was an adventurous guy. And, um, but we loved explosives, for example. <laughs> that's, uh, so we were always trying things that uh, she, she uh, taught us by example rather than by lecture. You know, I, I never figured that one out <laughs> with our kids. But uh, <laughs> the, the, that was something that I, th I think was tough. She was a violin teacher, so she really was very resourceful in getting us back together. And we had jobs from, and we, we, as a family, interesting, we made puzzles for the Newton schools. And she would go out and buy big four by eight pieces of masonite, and then go to a magazine and get interesting pictures, paste them to the masonite, and we would cut them out in a jigsaw. And we would cut them out so they'd hang together. You can pick it up by the corner. They were rugged, so they could use it in the grade school. And <laughs> what made that was kind of funny. So we were learning economics at an early <laughs> age. And, and, uh, but what made it funny is occasionally we'd get a call, and, and they thought they were you know, the, the Abley Puzzle Company or whatever it is. And that's a hello, you know. <laughs> Just, we were sort of young at the time. So it's, it, was, it, was, it was good. It was good. 
Yeah. I'm sorry? The writer? Oh, yeah, it, Rand. Yeah. Why don't, Rand, why did you say a few things about... Well, this, this was a story I um, was contacted by Emily gold who was the who was the editor of Amherst Magazine, uh, and she ran the basics of the story by me and asked if I might be interested in writing about it. This is really a story that any writer would uh, jump overboard very quickly to, <laughs> to, to, to jump into. There was an additional personal interest for me. I grew up in New London, and in fact, I lived four blocks from where the Abley brothers had lived uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, and we had a, a, a number of um, common acquaintances, it turned out. What, what I loved about this story, there, there are so many dimensions to it, and interestingly, uh, some of the, what had been played up in the NBC stories that you've seen was the uh, the emotional side of the story, uh, the the heartbreaking personal stories that went into it, and if you read through those many dozens of letters that uh, John's brother Bruce still has, as Bruce says, it's it's hard to read them to without with, with a dry eye at times. And one of the remarkable things about their mother, I think, was the effort she made in in starting those correspondences and then maintaining them with the survivors for years. An enormous amount of effort, care, and concern went into that. Um, so there was, the, there was the emotional side of the story, but then there was a very large technical side of the story. John and his brothers were obviously fanatical inventors, garage and basement inventors uh, from, from day one. And uh, Bruce, with whom I spent a lot of time, showed me a number of uh, photos of John's early inventions. I thought it was interesting that many of them were, were contraptions that had to do with water, uh, nautical themes, and indeed nautical rescue, in effect. He had, there were, there were some shoes that were called Jesus shoes, <laughs> that were designed to allow one to walk on water. <laughs> Uh, there, there was some sort of um, uh, modified bicycle that was supposed to be an underwater vehicle. Now Bruce, with great relish, tells the story about how one after another these spectacularly failed. <laughs> and so the, bi the, the underwater vehicle was a modified bicycle, the, the seat was taken off, and on the back, the pedals were still there, and on the back, instead of the back wheel, was a makeshift propeller that was actually taken from a, from a car radiator. Uh, and this tells a story about how John went charging into the water with this thing, pedaling away, and went straight down. <laughs> and only the rear propeller blade was sticking around and around and around. Then, then the story of the sub-ladies and their really obsessive devotion to, uh, to digging out the human stories. The, the last thing I'll say, and I think it will amuse you as, as classmates and friends of John, I, I think I went into the story with certain presuppositions, uh, and uh, there, was a, there was a questioner who asked when John's uh, emotions uh, sort of peaked, and I, I asked John a lot of questions about um, uh, really how difficult it was perhaps to grow up without his father, uh, when he found this story most, most moving. He was very guarded about these things. John, as you know, is an avidly intellectual person. He's interested in this story from any, num any number of perspectives that have to do with information theory, how communications networks allow people to pool resources, and so on. My dogged attempts to get you know, the heartfelt human story were, were continually, instantly rerouted by him. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so you know, I would say, well, what was it like, you and your three brothers here you know, living in Newton, uh, outside Boston, uh, growing up without your dad, and within five seconds, John would be on to, well, of course, in Newton, um, the uh, streets were arranged in a grid. <laughs> <laughs> the streets were arranged in a grid rather than a system of cul-de-sacs. It fosters a very different kind of social connectedness in the community. <laughs> you know, that's interesting, too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so for me, it was, a, it, was a, it was a terrific opportunity to learn a number of things that I didn't know about, uh, that, that's why you write after all, uh, but also to emerge with terrific admiration for John and his brothers and, and for the sub-ladies, uh, so I enjoyed it. Thanks.